you about all different kinds of ways that we can help promote physical activity in children, uh, particularly during the school time, not just in physical education, but um, all across the school day, before and after school, and even in, in evenings in the community and with their families. And uh, that was an example of something that classroom teachers can do with kids to integrate learning with movement uh, as they're teaching them the core content areas. So this could be a social studies lesson. They could go through their state or through the United States or whatever. So that was just a little example to get you warmed up and moving here at the beginning. Um, to start out with, you know, of course, we have to talk about the health benefits of physical activity, and everyone in this room knows about the health benefits of physical activity and why we do what we do, why we promote physical activity. Um, I want to particularly point out the benefits of reducing the risk for developing many chronic diseases and in helping to reduce the chance of becoming overweight and obese. Nearly one half of all of our children and adolescents across the state are above the 85th percentile uh, related to their body mass index, which makes them overweight or obese. In West Virginia, we have our own evidence of that. Um, I've been fortunate over the last 10 years to work with a project called the Cardiac Project, and it stands for Coronary Artery Risk Detection in Appalachian Communities. And uh, with this project, we screen, we offer in school health screening to all fifth grade students every year. So uh, we have about a 50% participation rate, somewhere between 40 and 50%. Obviously it's by active um, consent their parents have to agree because we actually draw blood in the schools. And um, so our data over the last, since 1998, we have screened um, over 76,000 students. And right there is the evidence that we're talking about. About 47% of our kids are above the 85th percentile, um, and with almost 19% of them being above the 95th percentile, which is considered obese. Um, related to that, uh, close to 24% are hypertensive, and 26% have abnormal blood cholesterol. Now keep in mind, these are fifth grade children fifth grade children in West Virginia. So we have a lot of work to do in West Virginia. Um, the next few, few slides just show some of our findings in various studies that help us to have a better understanding about our children and uh, our children in physical activity. In a baseline study of over 22,000 children, these, these were also fifth graders over the last 10 years. Um, when ask them some when we asked them some very basic physical activity questions, there was a 43% correct response rate that also included the question about how much physical activity they should get on a daily basis. What is the recommendation? Only 36% knew that they should be physically active 60 minutes a day. And keep in mind, we have a lot of initiatives now that. Um, focus on teaching kids that. And these are fifth graders and we're finding they still don't know that. Um, so that's concerning. Uh, but the majority say that they probably or definitely will be physically active tomorrow or a year from now. So they're positive about it. They're, they're going to be physically active. Um, right now we're doing a um, a program in middle schools, which I'll tell you more about later. It's called Choices. And uh, uh, as part of the needs assessment, we ask 645 middle school students what they would like to do in physical education class. And out of 35 possible curriculum units that they could choose, um, these were the top six. Swimming, bowling, climbing, kayaking, active gaming, and archery. These are West Virginia middle school students in rural West Virginia. But you can see they're not picking team sports. They're picking other things that they think they might like to do. And we need to listen to that. We need to think about that as we're uh, planning curriculum. Most of the students, almost 90 percent, said they would like to do these kind of activities in their communities. And 78 percent said that they would join after school clubs that also had these kind of offerings for them to participate in. 
Uh, of these students, 62% said that they participate in physical activity at least 30 minutes on most days of the week, but 47% said uh, when asked the question about 60 minutes, 47% reported that they did, which is about 50% of the kids. That's pretty good, I guess. Uh, we, want to see, we want to see that increase. This uh, study looked at overweight children that were in a program that I'll talk to you more about in a minute called Camp New You. These children were 11 to 14. There were 28 kids in this cohort. Um, during the two-week residence camp, these kids... Um, their average step count was 28,000. We think that overweight kids can't be physically active and don't want to be physically active, and that's not necessarily true. All of these kids were above the 95th percentile BMI. Uh, some of the kids even had 40,000 steps on multiple days. So they like to be physically active. They just want to do what they want to do. They want to, to be able to choose activities that they like. Um, of these students, only 33% said that they were physically active five or more of the last week, days of the last week for 60 minutes. And 60% and reported three or more hours of screen time a day, which we're not surprised about. This last one is about parent perceptions. We found that um, parent perceptions of children's physical activity and their child's related cardiovascular health outcomes, this is taken from a cardiac parent survey. Um, the parents who perceived their child to be less active than their peers had children on the average with significantly higher non-HDL cholesterol and BMI percentages. So um, this is a little contrary to what some of the recent literature says about parents' perceptions, that parents' perceptions uh, aren't really what, what, what the actual, um, ha what, what is actuality. So this was a, this kind of, um, was a little different indicator of parent perceptions related to physical activity and maybe they're more accurate than we think. I did look before I came about to see where you are in Texas and where your children's physical activity levels are uh, relate and see kind of how they relate to West Virginia. Actually, I found that they're pretty similar. Um, according to the 2009 Youth Risk Behavior Survey, the YRBS, the CDC-driven um, survey, these are the statistics I found for Texas. I think that... Um, 16% of high school, these are high school students though, remember. Most of our studies were with, where they were with elementary or middle school. So this is high school data. The West Virginia data is very similar to this. You see that uh, a little more than a third watch TV at least three hours a day. Um, most of the children, three-fourths of them say that they are not physically active for 60 minutes uh, the last seven days. 14% um, were obese which is a little lower than West Virginia. Um, this is interesting. 97% of schools allowed students to be exempt from taking, or, taking a required PE course. That's not okay. Um, kids should not be exempt from taking PE. And then only 45% of the schools offered opportunities for other kinds of physical activity. And that's what we want to see happen. Even in these high schools, we want to see more opportunities for kids to be physically active outside of organized uh, intercollegiate sports. So some of the risks that our sedentary children likely face, we know that they'll probably become uh, sedentary adults. Um, they will have an increased risk for obesity, obviously, and the chronic diseases there that um, we talked about earlier, and a shortened lifespan. So you'll hear a lot more about this in the lecture series um, tomorrow, I believe. But um, how does physical activity affect academic performance? That is becoming more and more, uh, that is studied more and more, and we're having more and more evidence that it does, in fact, affect academic performance, the level of physical activity that children participate in. Um, and this is a little different than fitness levels. Uh, that's a different, kind of a different subject, but I think um, more work needs to be done in this area about physical activity and, their, and its effect on academic performance. Here are some of the uh, recent ones that have shown positive effects on these. So what do we do about it? Well, that's what we're all trying to figure out. That's why we, we work, we go to work every day. 
Um, we have found out that everybody has to take responsibility for making physical activity important. It's a health, it should be a health priority in your state, in your area, in your schools. Um, so it's everyone's responsibility. It's not just the PE teacher, the health teacher, or the recreation leader. It's everyone's responsibility. Um, and the physical activity choice has to be the easy choice. And that just means there have to be opportunities. Uh, where I live in West Virginia, there, uh, there are many places where kids can't even walk down the berm of the road or they would get run over by a coal truck. There's not really a berm there. There's a road and then there's like a river on this side, a stream and a mountain on this side. So you have to think about that, those things and transportation has to get involved because we can't make them walk down the road if there's no place to walk. We can't encourage that. So opportunities in the environment is so important and so it's everybody's responsibility too to help us make phys physically act Physical activity choice, the easy choice. I don't think that's right. The physically active choice, yeah, that's right. Okay, so, so what's happening nationally that's helped driving uh, the effort and helping to support what we want to do as health educators and physical educators? Um, in 2008, the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans was published by the... Um, uh, Department of Health and Human Services and the CDC by the government basically and it's a evidence informed document that gives us credibility for what we do and says No, I'm, I think everybody can hear me right? Do you want me to have a microphone? Yeah, I, I have a PE voice, I'm good <laughs> I taught PE outside for years so I'm, I'm used to yelling or Projecting my voice, let's say that way. Um, but this document supports the 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity a day for, for youth. So you should always refer to that document when uh, you want to make your point that this is important and this is a national guideline. So what's the school's role in all of this? Well, you know that, that the school is where the children spend the biggest part of their time, the biggest part of their day. And so we are seeing lots of other national support for change and change that's saying that's calling for a more comprehensive approach in the schools not just physical education but during the whole day um, the national association for sport and pe came out with a doc a position statement in 2006 which i was fortunate to be able to chair and that was called the comprehensive school physical activity program that was kind of the first time that that terminology came forth as something that we should consider in schools. The concept has been around, but the term comprehensive school physical activity program really came out of this position paper from NASPE, the National Association for Sport and PE. Since that time, we see a lot of national initiatives now that are focused on comprehensive school physical activity program. One of the, the biggest ones right now that you hear about all the time um, is is the First Lady's Let's Move initiative. How many people have heard of that? Well, um, you should look it up on, on the website and see what's going on because she does, uh, it really is getting some national attention and it gets, uh, you know, the bottom line is whether you agree with uh, First Lady Michelle Obama or not, her concept of helping to make children healthier is an important one and it's getting national attention because of her position right now. Um, from that initiative, Let's Move in School uh, has also, um, is a spin-off from that, but it's basically just focused on the school. And then you've probably heard of local school wellness policies that have been, um, uh, I guess, designated by the USDA and, and every school that gets has free or reduced lunch must comply with the, that and must have a school wellness policy which includes nutrition and physical activity. Um, besides those national initiatives there's a lot of national organizations now that are saying uh, well we have our own um, program or whatever that supports these national documents and supports what's going on. One is the American Academy of Pediatrics. They have the 5210 um, campaign where they encourage doctors 
and healthcare providers to prescribe 5210 to their to their patients. Uh, five fruits and vegetables, no more than two hours of screen time, one hour of physical activity, and no sugary drinks. So um, that's an important. A lot of people are catching on to this, and and a lot of different um, national associations, like I said, have their own version of this type of campaign. So what are the components of comprehensive school physical activity? Here they are. Um, quality physical education is the cornerstone of that. Obviously you need quality physical education. Um, you should have breaks or recess for elementary kids and then those other opportunities during the day um, and after school, before school and so forth. Active transport. Is that doable in this, in this area? It, it certainly is, but in rural Texas, is that a doable thing? Could kids bike and walk to school? They could. So that's something that, that is a big initiative right now in a lot of states. Again, it doesn't work in West Virginia because m most schools are located in areas that children cannot walk to. Um, one thing I noticed when I came here, and my, my health ambassador, Danny, that picked me up, I said, it's so flat here. He says, really? It is? It's flat? He said, is it not like this where you live? I said, oh no, we have hills. Not mountains, just hills. We have hills everywhere. Um, Staff wellness is a part of it, and also family and community participation. I'm going to talk about some of the applications in the field that I work with in these different components. And um, please, if you have any questions about any of them, we can uh, certainly we'll have some time at the end to take those those questions, and then talk a little bit about how you connect the dots, how you get that support to make these kinds of things happen. Uh, related to quality physical education. One thing that my colleagues at, at WVU in the College of Physical Activity and Sports Sciences are working on right now is a project we call the Green Bar Choices Project. And um, we were fortunate to get a Carol M. White Physical Education Program Grant, which is a PEP grant. Have any of you heard of PEP grants? Nope. Well, they started about, I think, seven years ago. They're given out by the U.S. Department of Education. They're usually for around a million dollars for over three years, so they're huge grants. They started out as mostly for physical education equipment. So schools could apply for these grants. They were getting all these dollars to buy equipment, basically. Uh, there wasn't a very good evaluation system in place for it, so we weren't really sure how well they were working. Um, so they, there's been a lot of changes over the years. This year there were 76 recipients. Um, our grant was for $890,000, and we're focusing on two middle schools in Greenbrier County uh, with approximately 1,200 students collectively. Our goals are obviously to uh, enhance the quality of the physical education curriculum uh, and make it more standards based and also to improve the environment around the school um, and in the communities to enhance those comprehensive school physical activity program components. Um, I think the signature feature of this, of this grant and now of this program was that um, we have three components that we're working towards, and they're school, healthcare, and community. So it's not just focused on the school, but it's also focused on a referral system for those kids that are above the 95th percentile, so go, uh, BMI. So go back again to what I said earlier. If 50% of our kids fit into this category. Uh, they're going to be above the 50th percentile. So what do we do with people? We say, well, what do you do? Okay, you know all these kids are overweight. What do you do with them? Well, this is going to be a referral system to the school-based health clinics and then other clinics in the areas to work with these kids to do individualized plans and follow-ups and so forth. So it, this will actually happen outside the school setting, except in the school-based health centers. But then... Um, these kids will be identified in the school setting. And then in the community piece, we also look at um, doing these types of activities that I mentioned earlier in the communities. Uh, these, these schools that we're working in are um, consolidated schools, so we have nine community schools that feed into them, elementary schools. So we already have the infrastructure there to work in those schools in the community. Um, another 
project that I think is notable in West Virginia that I think really helps with quality physical education is um, a program that was started by the Department of Education, uh, the Office of Healthy Schools, a few years ago, in 2006 actually, and we've had about 300 teachers, PE and health teachers, go through this program right now. It's, they don't have to pay anything, they're selected to be in this program. And we focus on these four areas. So these are areas that teachers that may have taught for 10 years, maybe they didn't have this content in their in their programs. Um, maybe they're not up to speed on these. So these that's why these, these areas of emphasis were chosen. Um, we've graduated about 300 teachers now. It's a year-long program. They can get graduate credit to attend. And basically we come out of there with a bunch of teachers in our state that seem to know what they're doing and they're kind of the leaders. They become leaders in our profession. And I think that's really helped to improve quality physical education in, in our state. Um, two resources that I want to talk about that's related to during school uh, physical activity um, are things that you can also access because they're web-based. You could actually use them here in Texas if you, if you would like. Um, and they, they were developed by some of us um, and our you know, other colleagues within our College of Physical Activity and Sports Sciences, but they will be made, made available right now free of charge to anybody who wants to use them. So I just want to share those with you, Active Academics. This is uh, what it looks like right now. This is what it's going to look like in about two weeks. Uh, it's being overhauled, but right now it looks like this. And it's basically a database of lesson ideas, not plans, but ideas. And you don't just have to use them in a school uh, lesson. You could use them in a community lesson with children or whatever. But they focus mostly on, you can, you can search by um, the grade level and the content area. You can find the lesson idea. And um, you'll see here that it focuses on these content areas, and so if you pick grade four math, it's going to give you a group of, of activities that you might choose from to teach different content standards in fourth grade math that have movement in them. They all have movement, so kids have to get up and move. The one you did earlier, that's one that's on active academics. It would have been better if you had a little more room, and probably if you were in the fifth grade, but anyway, the example was there. Um, the, um, another part of the module is also, uh, or the ideas you can pick from are called energizers. And so those are classroom energizers, just, they don't have to focus on math or reading or science. They are just five or ten minute activities to get kids up and moving in between to give them a little break. Um, they're not even ten minutes, they're more like three to five minutes. And uh, so those are all on the website and there's a place where teachers can send in their own ideas and they're evaluated by a group of us and we decide if they're uh, appropriate and then we post them up there. So you can actually submit your own ideas on this website. Um, we, we, these are the considerations for content selection that we use and these are really uh, what you should use for any activity that you choose for kids. And I think that sometimes this is one of the big mistakes we make is like we pick games where uh, one or two kids move around or uh, you know people are waiting in line or it puts people on display and they're not really, um, other kids make fun of them and so forth. So these should be things you think about when you pick activities with kids. Uh, can all kids participate? Can they be successful? Uh, and so forth and so on. Those are things I just mentioned. And it's got to be fun. I think it's got to be fun. All right, so we created this, uh, we created this website for teachers, elementary teachers, pre-K through five, to help give them ideas on how to um, add movement to their teaching activities uh, during the classroom time. This is a, a website too that we developed. Actually, um, I did my doctoral work at Virginia Tech and uh, part of my, well, my dissertation was developing web-based instruction, uh, web-based instructional module, not this one, but um, as a spinoff from that, this one has been developed more recently and it's called Take Charge, Be Healthy. It is for middle and high school students and it, it 
Um, the focus is to improve adolescence, knowledge, attitudes, and behavior, obviously, related to physical activity, nutrition, and some related health issues like body weight and um, diabetes. So here again, um, it, it is free for school use. I mentioned that earlier. Teachers have to register their school. They have to register themselves as a teacher, and then they have to enter the kids' names in. The kids' names are not stored. We, we um, use their identifying number for them, but the reason we have to have the kids' names is because it is a program that uh, then... Uh, reports back to kids, they keep track of what they're doing, so if the child is on, on this website and they enter their physical activities in, then it can respond to their physical activities and keep track of them and show them their record and that kind of thing. But once the teachers have them registered, then obviously they could do it for homework, they can access it anywhere that they have internet access. Um, encourages health literacy, positive decision making, health advocacy, recognition of influences on their health and self-discovery and goal setting. So again, this is a classroom activity. They're not really up moving around being physically active, but it is giving them an, a, a health literacy, a health knowledge base about physical activity. Um, the 411 section is like the book section, if you will. Um, the difference, of course, is that it's interactive. That's what the internet allows you to do that books don't. And so it makes it more engaging for students. This one is uh, the part about... Uh, your health, this is one of the tabs in your health. And um, then related to physical activity, these are the areas that we are focused on, fitness, uh, trying to encourage them to, to think of new ideas that fit them and so forth, setting goals, big part of that. Nutrition, focus mo mostly on healthy eating and energy balance and reading food labels and portion size. And then the, the health, your health part, I mentioned uh, diabetes management or risks and management of diabetes and uh, body weight. So, um, just a couple, I just want to show you a couple of examples. This one, uh, we do have this section called Media Mania where they actually can watch a video. This one's Britney Spears about Pepsi. And so uh, it helps them to think about it and analyze it and then talk about their opinions about um, the media and how it is affecting their, he their health. There's also an activity and a diet, an activity tracker and a diet diary where they log in. It's a 48-hour recall, so um, kids can't typically remember more than 48 hours what they did. Uh, it looks something like this. This is a physical activity one. Uh, we've clicked on the combative here so they can see where it says info so they can see what some of the examples are. But they pick how long, how, uh, what the activity is, how long, the intensity level, and where. Uh, and then it keeps track of that and gives them feedback. There's also a speak out loud section where they voice their opinion about different uh, related areas to uh, healthy lifestyles. We, we do have built into this a pre-post um, survey, before and after survey, that looks at behavioral intentions and um, their perceived be their behaviors. Um, also, there's knowledge questions. This is a, one of the knowledge questions about physical activity and sport. You can see that there are significant changes, which you would expect in knowledge from pre to post. I mean, it's just like... That's why you take tests after you have a lecture, so that you see if you retained any of that information. Um, same thing with this, and so almost all the knowledge questions obviously come back uh, significantly different. Just another example. One more example here about BMI. So um, I think there are about, uh, I think there are, eight knowledge questions for each section, something like that. But we did see significant increases in positive health behaviors related to, uh, really, to, to all of the uh, behaviors that they reported. Their behavioral intentions as well were very positive, except for the likeliness they'll be physically active 60 minutes tomorrow. But it was high to begin with. 78% almost said that they would be physically active tomorrow. Uh, they, they always say that. They have really good attitude about it. You know, they're always going to be, whether they do or not, something else. They're going to be. 
Um, and this is just something that says how you can use Take Charge. And we will have this uh, PowerPoint available to you, so, and also a handout that has links to everything that's on here, so that if you uh, didn't catch it or you want to know more about it, that'll be made available to you. I'm not sure exactly how, but I know that Mary Beth's going to take care of it some way. Um, so those were a couple examples of in-classroom activities uh, or resources that you can use and that we use in West Virginia to help promote physical activity in the school setting. These are just, uh, I thought I would just throw these in before after school opportunities. We have a program in West Virginia called uh, uh, West Virginia on the Move. I don't know if you've heard of America on the Move, but it was started probably 10 or more years ago in Colorado. And uh, the states were encouraged to, um, to develop their own on the move program. Um, and so we have West Virginia on the move. It is still in existence. I'm not sure America on the move is still in existence. But um, we've been fortunate to be able to fund $5,000 grants to about 10 schools a year to help them do something to promote comprehensive school physical activity program. These are three or four examples of after school uh, you know, well, this one is before school. It's a DDR drop-in club where kids could go in and do DDR in the morning. I think it was a high school. This after school um, was a walking program. It was a challenge with their kids and their parents on their track at, their new track at school. This one was a playground project, and they allow kids to use that after school. And then an after school bike club. So those are some examples that have uh, come about because of that grant program. And then the family-based program that I want to talk about is called Camp New You. And this is a program that we started three years ago. My colleagues and I uh, came up with this idea. Obviously, there are so many uh, overweight and obese children in our, in our culture, and we wanted to try. We, we realized that with young children, you have to, you have to get to their families. They can't change by themselves, not when they're 11 years old. So this program focused on the family unit, although it had a two-week residence camp with the children in the summer where the kids actually came to WVU and stayed with us in the dorm. I thought I was past all that. I used to work camps when I was like 20, and I didn't know I was going to do that again, but I started doing that about three years ago, and it was an experience. Uh, we kept the kids for two, two weeks, and um, they're parents came back on the weekends. We had educational sessions for their parents when they were there and physical activity opportunities for the family. And of course the, the, the purpose was to help them identify and practice lifestyle changes both in food intake and physical activity participation and decreasing their sedentary, uh, their sedentary time, screen time. Oh, that's just a Graphic kind of shows some of the things that we did there in the program. There's our, our mountaineer. I'm sure you all wanted to see that. I wanted to make sure that was on there. Uh, I've pretty much already said these things. I didn't mention we did have a three, after the two-week residence camp, we had uh, three follow-up weekends during the year where the whole family unit had to come for a weekend at a state park. And then they had lifestyle coaches throughout the whole year where they called them every two weeks and talked to them and counseled them and so forth. Um, these are just some of the what we considered the signature features of the program. Not anything any different than what you would do here if you, if you had a camp here. Uh, a little bit about the enrollment criteria. They had to be above the 85th percentile body mass index. All of the kids we've had in both of the cohorts of this program were above the 95th percentile except one. And so um, they, there are the ages, the physician had to refer them and say that they could participate in physical activity. And the last one is really important and we almost didn't do it and it turned out to be one of the most important ones and that was to get their commitment in writing for why they wanted to be a part of the program and that they would complete the program. And just them having to write that down and give it to us I think helped uh, keep everyone in the program for the most part. Here was a typical day at camp. We did lots of physical activities, group activities, individual activities. We let them choose different activities and so forth and so on. Um, we did do behavioral counseling. We weren't 
food police, they could choose any food they wanted. We didn't, but we tried to ask them to talk about the, their food choices. Uh, we were in a cafeteria style setting for all of our meals, which made it kind of difficult. So, um, and then all of our activities related to the Richmond activities had to do with healthy lifestyles for the most part. Here's just some pictures of some of the things that they did. Um, This was an interesting time. We took them out on these pontoon boats and we got out in the middle of the lake, the Cheat Lake that's up there in Morgantown and they, uh, we had a, a really big storm. And they were in the water and we all of a sudden, I mean it came on really fast and we were trying to get these still children up into the boats and it was not a good thing. But we, we managed and they went out the next day. They were excited to go the next day. They did lots of walking and I mentioned that to you earlier. This is the program where they walked like 28,000 steps a day on average. They wanted to walk everywhere. When the families were there, we also tried to, this is, uh, I think, Frisbee Golf, tried to provide a variety of physical activity choices for them to do, and uh, along with the social activities, they got into the dances and so forth. And then we also tried to sh give them resources and show them things that they could do at home. This was in the winter months when they would have to do things inside for the most part. We did see... Um, Weight, the initial weight loss for both cohorts was about four pounds during the camp, which we thought was pretty good. And the thing to note about this is that it mostly had to do with physical activity because their, their food intake, I don't think, really changed that much because they had access to a lot of different foods. And so I think it was their increased physical activity levels really that helped them to lose the weight. And again, we didn't focus on weight loss. We didn't make that a big deal. We focused on lifestyle changes. Um, here were some of the, the averages for their, the campers over 11 days. And these were self-reported. But you can see they ate lots of fruits and vegetables, no soft drinks. They did do that. And then they were physically active over two hours a day. So now, how, what are we talking about when we talk about connecting the dots? Well, there's, um, I want to, to get to something that I feel like you'll particularly be interested in here at, at the end, but I do want to say that it really does take coordinated efforts to make these happen. It's easy for me to stand up here and say, oh, we do this, we do that, do we do this? Well, they didn't just come out of the blue because we decided we wanted them to, we wanted to develop these and implement them. It does take coordinated efforts between a lot of people utilizing a lot of resources that are available, and we really need to join forces with all the different population sectors, not just in education, to make these kinds of things happen. I mentioned West Virginia on the move. They're one of our partners, and um, they do make those grants available and we work with them to help select the grant recipients and then to uh, mentor them as they're uh, improving their physical activity offerings in the schools. The, uh, this is just a little more about the grants program, but the, the um, thing that I think is really worth noting here, well this is, a, this is West Virginia and these are all of the states where, or the counties where there have been grant recipients uh, for this West Virginia on the Move schools grant. But I think the lessons learned are really important because this is, if you can find someone in your area that would be willing to donate $20,000 a year to give um, grants to schools, you can do a similar program. The thing that has been most amazing about this is even though they're receiving $5,000, they usually leverage other funds from their communities because schools think that's a big deal. If you get a $5,000 grant, you're like, oh, wow, we got a $5,000 grant. We have a poster in front of our school that says we're a schools on the move school. And uh, so now the bank in the, the local bank is going to give us another thousand and someone else is going to give us another thousand. So we found that happening. We also found that the schools that have quality physical education programs were more likely to implement these other components so it is important to have strong leadership and support in the schools and it did raise visibility about physical activity in their communities which I think is really important and just facilitated that collaborative effort as I mentioned. <coughs> Um, our West Virginia Department of Education Office of Healthy Schools is great. Uh, I don't know what 
<laughs> when I talk about what happens in West Virginia and you think about Texas, it's very different. We're, we're one little part the size of Texas. So it's easy for us to say, oh yeah, we have a statewide initiative. For you to have a statewide initiative, it would have to be much bigger, um, obviously. So it might be a district for you. But in our state, the Department of Education, Office of Healthy Lifestyles, um, the new superintendent is now requiring all schools to add 15 minutes of physical activity to their day. And it can't be PE or recess. It has to be something else. So that's the first time we've ever had a superintendent of schools that's, that stood up and said, I think this is important. And so that, that's been great for us. I mentioned the academy. And this next part, right now they're serving as the leader in the education sector for our West Virginia Physical Activity Plan, which leads me to the last thing I want to talk about and that's dearest to my heart right at the moment because this is what I'm spending all my time doing right now um, and that is a new West Virginia physical activity plan not just for schools but encompasses all those sectors that I mentioned earlier including education we call it active West Virginia 2015 by 2015 we hope to be able to see a difference in physical activity participation and opportunities in um, in our state here's the aim is to create a statewide culture that facilitates physical activity lifestyles in every societal sector in every region of our state regardless regardless of socio demographic factors or other barriers that we face that's our aim um, this plan is modeled after the National Physical Activity Plan. I don't know if you're familiar with the National Physical Activity Plan it looks like this it came out in 2010 and um, it was released in 2010 and it, they used people all across the uh, country that in these different societal sectors that were experts in these sectors to formulate an evidence-based um, white paper on each of the sectors saying this is what's going on in, in the United States and this is what we need to have happen. From there they developed this plan with strategies and tactics for each of those sectors. Um, part of that their um, mission is to get states to then develop their state specific plans uh, right now there are only two states in the nation that have finalized a state specific plan it is West Virginia and Texas if you did not know that you need to look it up because Texas has a statewide plan I think the method for um, the, the method for developing the plan was very different. Again, a lot of it has to do with the demographics of the two states. Um, but this is the West Virginia plan. It was released in um, January, on January 19th, to the public. It is a document that looks like this, and uh, we have an executive summary. And within that, you will find strategies and tactics that have been developed through a pretty strategic process over the last two years. I thank you again for having me here. It's been a wonderful time here in Aggie Land, first time. And I hope it's not the last time. And to all you health majors, um, thank you for being in this profession. Thank you for being dedicated to improving the health of Americans because that's so important. And good luck with your, with your endeavors. So thank you again.